Lord be with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal we may worship you in spirit and in truth, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Annapolis Lutheran Church. We uh, started our ministry in a sanctanasium. That's gymnasium and sanctuary merged together in one word. Pastor Miller, I think, invented that word. And then we moved to a traditional sanctuary here in Edgewater. Nobody ever imagined we would worship in a parking lot. And I tried for a few hours to come up with a pithy word like sanctanasium for the parking lot and simply couldn't do it. Merging, mer merging parking lot with sanctuary was just too difficult. If somebody has an idea, let me know. We can add that to our history. But here we are back in the Sanctanasium again. But it's a reminder to us that the church, from the Greek ecclesia, is the people. The church is the people. Where we are gathered around the word and the sacrament, the church is present. Thanks be to God for that. Speaking of gathering, I do believe we have some folks joining us from outside. If you can hear me, please honk your horn. There they are. Thank goodness they can hear me. That's good. Uh, just a couple other announcements. You look at the back of your bulletin. Uh, we are very excited to be hosting a blood drive in the coming months. Uh, if you want to know more information about that, please look at the, the bulletin and also contact the appropriate people. And you can contact the church office if there are any questions about it. So about the service itself, just like last week, for the sharing of the peace, we want to be conscious of the social distancing, so we want to you know, do a bow instead of handshakes if we can. Now for communion, just like last week, we'll start on this side, go from the back and work our way to the front, and then we'll switch to this side, we get the people sitting against the wall first, and then from the back to the front. There is grape juice available if you would like. You don't have to pick it up in the cups. There will be grape juice available in the bottle as well. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in shoe, and thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us of all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we'll sing with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory, for Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Care for your church, O Lord, with perpetual mercy, since we totter and are sure to fall without your grace. Remove that which will harm us and arrange that will make us whole. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Isaiah, the 51st chapter, beginning with the first verse. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and goodness and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me and I will set my justice for light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The word of the Lord. We will now read Psalm 138 responsively. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading this morning is from Romans, the 11th chapter, starting with the 33rd verse. 
Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not, have, do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> we all know the top three rules for evaluating real estate, right? They are location, location, and location. But perhaps we do not know that location is also a rule for interpreting scripture. The locations in which Jesus teaches and preaches often have great significance. If we investigate these settings, we often get a better understanding of the passage as a whole. In general, Geographical landmarks such as mountains or the wilderness and the Bible, the wilderness and the desert are the same. I'll, I'll use those interchangeably. But the mountains and the wilderness have a great significance in Scripture. Mountains are rich and diverse in symbolism, but in Jesus' day, many thought of mountains as a place of chaos where deities or demons and cosmic spirits dwelled. Mountains were a place beyond human understanding, beyond human control. So despite these tense conditions of mountains, Jesus routinely positions himself on a mountain to either teach, seek solitude, 
or pray. In Matthew 5, Jesus gives his sermon on the mountain, one that we're all familiar with. Jesus is standing in a place symbolized as chaos as he teaches and preaches about the way, the truth, and the life. As he preaches about order, which is his kingdom, his rule. So in effect, Jesus is bringing order to chaos. That's at least the symbolism there. Later in Matthew, Jesus utilizes mountains for solitude and prayer. His ability to venture onto mountains alone reveals, as one commentator notes, his identity as a holy man with a special place in the hierarchy of cosmic powers. In other words, Jesus' courageous spirit going into the mountains alone to pray reveals that he belongs there. He belongs where cosmic spirits dwell. It tells us something about his identity. It tells us that he is divine himself. The desert or the wilderness was also be believed to be beyond human control and understanding. But maybe unlike mountains, the barren desert or the wilderness also could represent death and decay. So it is quite significant then when Jesus feeds 5,000 hungry souls amid the barren desert. The location of this event helps us understand that Jesus brings life to death. Jesus brings life to death. The imagery and the symbolism of the wilderness also features prominently in Jesus' temptation in chapter 4. We read earlier in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit directly into the wilderness to face temptation. The location of the temptation is critical for us to fully appreciate the meaning of this passage. You will recall that, the, that Israel, upon its divine escape from bondage in Egypt, wandered in the wilderness and fell prey to temptation of pagan worship. They failed to honor God in their trek toward the promised land. When Jesus enters the same symbolic space of the wilderness as Israel did before him, and count, he counters each temptation with the word of God, he thus succeeds where Israel failed. He is faithful where they were unfaithful. This means that Jesus is not only undoing the sins of Israel by being faithful where they were unfaithful, he is also proving his status as the unblemished Lamb of God who can make a perfect sacrifice for sin. So while the mountainous and wilderness locations signal important revelations about Jesus' identity and purpose, so do the geopolitical regions, the locations, regions. The Gospels are always careful and intentional about tracking Jesus' travel. These are for historical purpose, but they're also for symbolic purposes. Last week, for example, Matthew is clear to tell us that Jesus withdrew to Tyre and Sidon, and Sidon, excuse me, locations outside of the covenantal Jewish boundary. It's very significant. When Jesus proclaims that the Canaanite woman has great faith, we learn that the gospel is therefore being democratized outside of the traditional Jewish boundaries. We learn that the Jewish messenger is ultimately going to bring his message, his kingdom, to those outside of that, to the whole world. And this brings us to today's passage. Again, Matthew is very careful to mark the passage of Jesus into the region of Caesarea Philippi. This location matters greatly if we are to fully appreciate the interaction that Jesus has with his disciples here. Caesarea Philippi was home to an international Mount Rushmore of sorts where the Syrian god Baal, the Greek god Pan, and the Roman emperor Caesar all had temples dedicated to them for worship and veneration. Jesus and his disciples are inhabiting a region where massive stone buildings were erected to testify to the importance of these gods, Baal, Pan, and Caesar, which the Romans considered the emperor of God. It is quite clear to everyone who journeyed through that land what people thought about those gods. Right? Because they built massive temples to him. Perhaps this is what prompts Jesus' question. It is in this context, surrounded by the massive structures, venerating the so-called gods, that Jesus asks his disciples. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? 
As one commentator notes, it's as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the world religions and all of their history and splendor and determined and demanded to be compared to them. The answer the disciples give is a bit underwhelming. Not that prophets were weak people or, weak, or had weak purposes or messages, but they're not exactly gods, nor, they nor, nor do they have overwhelming buildings and statues built in their honor. So Jesus tries again. He personalizes the question, directing, it, directing the question to the disciples. But who do you say, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, without skipping a beat, hits the nail on the head. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. As Jesus blesses Peter, he teaches that it is not from flesh and blood that Peter received this message, but from God the Father. Now again, think location here. It is not from flesh and blood. It is not from human institutions or man-made stone structures that cultivates Peter's belief in Jesus, but God himself. Peter does not need the stone buildings to venerate God, because Peter knows that God is before him in the person of Jesus. That God is before him in the person of Jesus. Jesus goes on to teach that he will build his church upon this rock. What is the rock? More commentary has been written on this text than pretty much any other passage in Scripture, so I'm told. Given the Catholic Church teaching on the authority of Peter as the first pope and the authority of his heirs. Many in that tradition point to this text as justification for the office of the Pope. Now, without getting into a very long theological whirlwind, we'll be here for two hours. Let it suffice to say for our purposes that the rock Jesus is referring to is not the person of Peter, but the confession of Peter. Not the person of Peter, but the confession of Peter that Jesus is what? Lord and Christ. That's the rock. The identity of Jesus. Jesus is claiming the confession of him as Lord and Savior. The confession that he is God is stronger and mightier than the stone temples surrounding him. Jesus is claiming that the belief in him as the Christ, as the Savior, is the rock on which we should stand as a church. Percy Shelley's poem, Ozymandias, exemplifies this. The poem recounts a traveler who comes across a, a ruined city where a great statue of a former king has crumbled. Only the base remains, and the base, the inscription on the base reads as follows. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Shelley concludes the poem writing, Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Temples fall. Institutions fail. People, even kings, die. Jesus does not fall. Jesus does not fail. Jesus does not permanently die. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the rock yesterday. Jesus is the rock today. And Jesus is the rock tomorrow because he is alive despite the trials and the tribulations of his passion, of his ministry. His love endures forever, we read in the psalm today. A God is, as Martin Luther teaches in the large catechism, is anything in which our hearts must rely on, anything which we find refuge in all need. That's the definition of God. Now, according to this definition, we're all guilty. We're all guilty of trusting gods engineered by our own fellow humans, flesh and blood. We have built structures that hold 100,000 people for sporting entertainment. How many people in America today are more concerned about missing the game from the stands than they are missing church from the pews? Right? Who is their rock? What is their rock? Who is their God? What is their God? Who and what is your God? 
What edifices have you constructed to serve as your primary source of hope and refuge? Is it money? Is it a house? Is it your car? Is it your mountain bike? Guilty. We can lose all of these things. We can lose all of it. We can be injured, lose our ability to participate in our hobbies. We can lose our jobs. We can lose our car. We can lose our homes. We can even love or lose those whom we love dearly, our spouse, our children. Those things can be lost to us. When you lose the ultimate source of your meaning or hope, writes Tim Keller, there are not alternative sources to turn to. It breaks your spirit, he concludes. There are many examples of this that we can think of. What happens to celebrities when they lose their fame, their source of meaning and hope? What happens to athletes who tie their hope and purpose to their athletic ability or frame only to be injured in a game? What happens to these people? The only way to free ourselves from the disappointment of false gods, again, writes Keller, is to turn back to the true one, the living God, who revealed himself on the cross. It is the only Lord who, if you can find him, can truly fulfill you. If you can find him, find him. You know, while location is critical for understanding the scriptures, it is also critical for our life together. Location matters. I am not on a journey to find God. I'm not. I don't think I ever have been. St. Paul highlights this folly. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable are his ways. The sheep does not look for and find the shepherd. The shepherd looks for and finds the sheep, which is precisely why Jesus has promised to be with us in certain locations. Certain locations. He promises to find us at this table where he manifests himself and give us a foretaste of our ultimate location, his kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us pray for the church, the world, and for all those in need. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us of those things of which our conscience is afraid. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, many of our brothers and sisters are persecuted for their faith. We lift up to you the Coptic Christians, the Lutheran Church of South Sudan, the Lutheran Church of Myanmar, and Pastor John Cowell. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, your Son healed all who came to him. Many of our brothers and sisters are struggling with illness, sadness, or despair. Sustain and strengthen them, especially during these uncertain times. We remember especially Eduardo, Hard Butler, Sally Hewitt's younger daughter, Kay, and Karen Schrader's brother, Tom Jeff, Susie Lutz, Julie Stegelbeck, and Frank Williamson. Bless them with your healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, minister to our members who are homebound or alone, especially Carolyn Buttemeyer, Jean Clark, Henrietta Conlon, Teresa Dearborn, Audrey Gilbert, Alice Johnson, Peggy Martin, and Betty Stroll. Remind them you are always with them. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, protect and safeguard all who serve our nation and the military at home and overseas. We ask you to especially protect Lieutenant Commander Brennan Colgrove during his deployments. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing upon our sister congregation in the North American Lutheran Church. Sustain St. John's Lutheran Church in Roanoke, Virginia. May you bless them as you have blessed us. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, keep us ever mindful of those who tend to the sick and the dying. They put themselves in harm's day every day. We remember the doctors, nurses, EMTs, police, and firefighters, and all first responders who are working selflessly during the coronavirus pandemic. Keep them safe and well. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace of Christ with a reverent bow to our neighbors.
I don't know. This is a lot of changing again today. Let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we're humbled and thankful that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to dwell bodily, to be our rock, and to give us this fellowship that we hold so dear. We now ask your blessing upon our musicians that they may proclaim the gospel through song and praise. In your name we pray. Signs of your gracious love. 
Receive him for the sake of himself, loves himself for us. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so now with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in this holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, to abide in the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our, our souls washed through the most, most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember us, Lord, in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will, will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good.
We stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. I give the blessing. Uh, the last hymn we will be singing verses 1, 3, and 7. Verses 1, 3, and 7. 6. six. One, one through six. 1, 3, and 6. 1, 3, and 6. There is no one, three and six. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.